Mm. And not so much with the um, – But uh, the, cuff, the cuff on the ultimate is kind of chintzy, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. And then um, – uh, and so adding a little bit – it was kind of funny, but adding the stiffness up top with the – pro um i think either the pro or the expert backwind um and what they also wanted to do is i think rise the um or raise out the cuff height a little bit Mm -hmm. as well um because it was a little bit low for most people Um, yeah it's like the the liner almost sticks out of the cuff on those boots totally it's funny because um they they're supposed to be sending me a prototype in the next few i don't know it's supposed to be here we'll see what happens but uh i'm in the pro right now and um i'm just like i mean i'm so psyched on it that like with you know to add like 150 grams or 200 grams per foot with the pro um it's just really hard for me to like find something that i really enjoy and then to make a switch you know and like you know god damn it it, it uh, I don't know, the I even like hesitated going to the back um to the link levers because which Phantom was not happy with me about for a while. Um guys the the presentation's open just so you know. <laughs> We've got thirty two people it looks like logged on here. We got about two minutes till we start the presentation here. We're just working on the live stream guys. Um so but then once I actually like made that decision to uh switch switch over to the link levers, I was like holy cow, man, this is like, um, I don't know. I, I, I really was very psyched with it. And, you know, I feel like it hasn't, um, hasn't changed my downhill ability much. Like I, I oh, like totally. to free ride some. And I mean, one thing that I really had to do was just like adjust my stance a little bit here and there, you know, like make it a little bit more narrow by like half an inch and like turn my back foot in. And of course I'm not riding switch. And so, but I'm still um, negative in my back foot. So I'm still riding like negative five. Um, so I'm not having to go totally positive. Um, yeah. But I'm still able to like spin 360s, which is the only thing I was able to really do on a, on a soft boot anyway. But, uh, nice. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Man. I, you know, there's been a couple things with the link lever that they've, uh, they've had to adjust since they've come out with them. But I really do feel like it's, you know, for me, for, for me anyways, it's, it's, um, it's allowed some progression and, and, uh, some uphill ability. And I don't know, I, I, I do see it being the future, but I also respect, uh, the soft boot movement as well. So it's like, um, but I, uh, I will say like, I do struggle going out with soft booters. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, Cody, we're going to cut off our turtle combo right here. Um, and everyone that is tuned in right now for Front Range Split Fest, thank you guys so much. Um, we have assembled a team of awesome panelists. A lot of our professional guide team is here with us tonight. Um, but yeah, just thank you guys for tuning in. We've, you know, we take a lot of pride in putting on Front Range Split Fest every year raising money for Friends of Birth at Pass, raising money for ARI, um, and just getting our community together. It's a huge part of, of why we do everything we do here at Weston, um, is just engaging our community. And, and right now we're all, you know, we're, we're in a, a predicament, right? We're in a place that maybe we'd rather not be. We tend to be outside a whole lot. And, and it's, you know, being stuck at home is tough. And it's, um, it's just important for us to be able to reach out to you guys and let you know that we're all here as a community. So hopefully um, you guys are uh, within reaching distance of a beer and can crack one open, kick back, enjoy. Um, We're going to get down to it. So enjoy. Cheers to you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Good old Grand Teton right there. Um, So, you know, with that being said, we do encourage all backcountry enthusiasts to really stay at home during the crisis follow all local, state, and federal guidelines for COVID-19. So um, since we couldn't do Front Range Split Fest, we are going to be doing an online fundraiser for ARI this year. And you can get all of the details at westonbackcountry.com, but we're going to be opening up two of next year's models to to two lucky individuals that want to be the first people in Colorado, if not the world, to own these boards. So uh, the board on the left is the hatchet split. This is a an amazing board we've been working on for several years. It's a volume shifted board, which means short, fat, and tons of fun and powder. 
Um, and so that, that is a board we're releasing next year as part of our PAL Slayer series. It is a limited edition. Um, you know, these are gonna sell out quick next year. You could be the first person to have one. And then our new Eclipse Split. This is our new women's half moon swallowtail split board. This is a killer board for women. It's an amazing powder board. Um, it's, it's been designed and tested by our women's split boarding team. So we think both these boards are gonna be amazing. And we wanted to open them up to you guys for, for tuning in to give you kind of first dibs. So you can go to westernbackcountry.com to check out um, how to get those boards. So tonight we are going to be covering, you know, choosing your first or your first or your next split board setup. We're going to have some tips from the pros on that. We're going to discuss binding skins, avi gear, first aid. Um, and we're going to have recommendations on those things from our guide team. So we're going to go over an in-depth packing list and we're going to have a gear discussion with all these great guides. So. Um, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce a few of these guys. You can only see me and Justin right now, but we have, looks like eight professional guides on our um, crew right now that are going to be tuning in. So Justin Ibarra and Pat Gephardt of Colorado Adventure Guides um, are here. They're going to be kind of our main presenters. They're our local guides here, and they've really been fundamental in the development of all of our different programming that you guys have been seeing out there. We've also got Michael Ackerman and Josh Jesperson of the Silverton Avalanche School. Um, these are two of our, you know, favorite guides here in Colorado. They're, they're going to be here. You guys feel free to turn on your videos right now. Say hi to the, 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 the people here. Uh, we've got Zach Husted who just jumped on there. He's uh, from White Room Tours, and he'll be guiding this next season over in Crested Butte. So um, we've also got Cody Hughes of Utah Mountain Adventures, uh, one of our favorite guys over in Salt Lake. We've got Josh Jesperson, you can see down there, uh, chimed in. He's the guy you may have heard of that did all the 14ers in Colorado on a split board and broke the speed record. No big deal. Feel free to reach out to these guys, you know, throughout this presentation if you have any specific questions. We've also got Will Sperry of Alpenglow Expeditions out of Squaw Valley, California. Um, he is holding down the Weston crew over there in Tahoe. And we've even got our Canadian representative here, Adam Zock, one of my favorite guides up in uh, Revelstoke, BC, guides for Kapow Guiding. Um, so we have, we have really put together a, a crew of experts here um, that you guys, uh, you know, should really reach out to during, during this presentation, right? And, and, you know, ask them questions, turn on your chat feature. Uh, we've got a lot of great uh, guides on here, and we want you guys to be able to, to check them all out. Well, awesome, guys. Uh, we will continue on here. Um, and we'll do a quick poll here. You know, who here has been split boarding before? Let us know right here. You should have a, a poll selection there. Just click on that and we'll see. Lord Almighty, we got a lot of people chiming in here. Looks like about 75, 80%, about 85% of the people have been split boarding here before. So that's awesome, guys. Looks like, yeah, it looks like a ton of you guys have, have been split boarding before. Some haven't. We're going to be going over uh, great information for, for all of you. So, so this is going to be beneficial for every person in this webinar. Awesome, guys. Perfect. So, you know, choosing a split board um, is something I personally blew the first time I did it. Um, and and, and it, it's a really important choice. That, and it's, I think a lot of people kind of take it for granted sometimes. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a big choice and you need to do it right, you know, the first time. So we're going to kind of run through a few of the things that, that we really um, recommend when you're choosing a board. So a lot of people are familiar with the twin shape, right? A lot of people ride this on resort. It's what a lot of people tend to gravitate towards when they're buying their first split, you know, and I really feel like, you know, a lot more people should be on something that's a little bit more directional. They're riding powder most of the time and unless you really ride switch or plan to ride switch most of your day in the backcountry you should really be considering more of a directional board even a, a really sick powder shape like this but these are really the the kind of shapes that are out there they have a little bit longer nose a little bit shorter tail but they're you know similar to what you've seen on the market right so you've got a um, a lot of great options there perfect we got a few people chiming in the chat good to see you guys so when you're, when you're sizing a board, I would say, you know, just as important as the style is to make sure that you get the right size. Most people are used to sizing to about their chin, you know, for your resort board. Now, when you're in the backcountry, you know, you need to size up a little bit, right? You're going to be 
riding probably, you know, deeper snow, lower angle snow, and you've got much more weight in your pack, right? So you want more surface area, which creates more float. So we really recommend sizing up two to five centimeters. And the thing I want you all to really consider is your width of your board. You know, if you have a nine and a half, 10, 11, 12 boot, you should definitely be on a wide board. Toe and heel drag um, is not something you want on your first turn into this big, beautiful run that you just hike five hours up to. Um, I've slid down a couple because I had too skinny of a board. You know, you don't want something crazy like this, but you want something nice and fit so you, your toes not dragging and your heels not dragging when you go to make those first set of turns, right? And then camber, you know, I think is super important when we're, when we're talking split boards, right? There's a lot of different camber profiles out there on the market, right? And it's everyone, you know, here probably understands what reverse camber is and what camber is. And, you know, we really tend to recommend camber underfoot um, because you're touring on this thing, right? When I'm in tour mode, my feet are right here and all my weights pressed right here. So I can actually have all of this camber pressing into the ground and creating, you know, surface tension and, and I have that surface area and I, it really grips the snow. But if I'm on a full reverse camber board, I have a lot less of that um, edge hold under my foot. And if you're, you know, crossing an icy slope, uh, if you're in a no fall zone, the last thing you want is, you know, not a lot of um, edge control, right? So, so we really like kind of an extended camber profile, especially for touring. And then just the early rise in the nose and tail. So it, it, that's really kind of what we recommend for people getting into split boarding. So really it's important to choose the right style, choose the right size, and then choose the right camber profile. Very important. So, and the last thing I'd say on boards is just don't split your own at this point. Um, you know, all, all the guys on this call have gone into developing split boards, you know, and we're a split board manufacturer. So we put a ton of, of trial and tribulations into these boards and we, we, we just, we put everything we can in to make them awesome boards. And if you have your favorite board and you slice it in half, you just ruined your favorite board. You know, that core is, is not the same core that you've been riding and it's not going to ride the same, you know? So really what you should be doing is, you know, listening to the experts, buy a, a board made by a split board company, right? Don't buy um, a do it yourself board or a do it yourself kit. If you love that board, keep it, ride it. You know, if it's beat up, put it on a wall, but, but don't, split it and expect that to be a really great tool for the backcountry. These days you could get a used split, you know, on Craigslist, but it's still made by a manufacturer, right? So that's our big thing. Whether you buy a Weston, don't buy a Weston, buy a split board made by a manufacturer, right? Because it's, there's just a million reasons <laughs> that I'm not going to go into, but uh, you know, we have true inner, inner sidewall metal edges. We have holeless bases, polyamide top sheets, metal reinforcements in the nose and tails. You know, our boards are tail weighted, which is like the main thing. Like when you pick your board up, that tail needs to drop. And if it doesn't, you know, it's a, it's a rough day in the back country. So we put all that thought into these boards. And again, they're tested by some of the best guys in the world right now. So it's, you know, let the experts kind of, um, you know, do that R&D for you, you know, and trust the judgment of these guys. And, and your riding style is what you want to be thinking about, right? When you're picking your split board, not if your board's going to fall apart, you know, three miles into the back country. So um, we're going to kick it over to some questions now. Um, any questions here on choosing your first board? We're going to kind of um, look through the questions here. Love it. We got some great conversation going on here, guys. Thank you. Everybody just seems to be agreeing with us. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, any questions on, um, on the – oh, actually, let's see here. Too. Any questions on choosing a board? Anything? There we go, Ben. We got we got one on there. How do you know if the board is too long? Yeah. Any any of the guides want to field that question? I think the 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 main thing, like say you're riding and it's just really hard to to go edge to edge and it doesn't feel nimble. You might be on too big of a board if it feels like it's just not nimble in the snow. You know, I like to ride a short fat board because I can get that that surface area into a smaller, more nimble package. Um, that's why we designed that board, the hatchet, to get away from really big, long boards that aren't as nimble in the backcountry. Yeah, Ben, this is Cody here. I would I would totally agree with that. I, I would say inside the ski area, um, I used to ride something like 159 to 161, yep. um, especially if it was fully cambered. And now I... Uh, I ride a 157 carbon backwoods in the backcountry, and 
you know, since it's directional and set back a little bit with the camera between the fit uh, foot and uh, early rise rocker, um, you know, it's going to add a couple centimeters. And so it's like, yeah. I feel like I'm riding that 159 to 160, which definitely adds that nimbleness to it, but doesn't yep. add that length. Perfect. And so we got another couple questions here. When we're talking about sizing up, would we size up from what I'd buy in a powder board or, you know, to ride at a resort or size up from something you ride daily? So I would, when I'm talking about sizing up, I mean like I ride a 155 in a twin shape. And when I'm moving up to a powder board directional shape, I'm probably going up 150, you know, one or 158, 160. So, you know, a powder board, you don't have to size up as much because they're already wide. They're already directional. They already have all those things going for them, right? But as you move towards more of a resort board, like a twin, you have to significantly, you know, um, size up. But, you know, anywhere from two to five centimeters is good. It's not, um, it's not a huge difference. You know, we're talking two to five centimeters where you're looking at about that much, right? So it shouldn't be huge. It's certainly not going to affect your climbing ability, which is the next question we, we got here. And so, you know, it's really just, to make sure you're staying on top of the snow um, and you're not dropping down and, and having that, you know, inability to go where you want to go. Right? Like our, our goal is to get out and ride powder, right? We want to float. We want, we want to have fun and ride powder. And that's what most of us are out there doing when we're first getting into split boarding. So you want to make sure the board you buy gives you that float, right? My first board was like a 158 twin um, and it just wasn't big enough for me. And I rode it centered, you know, and it's, I really should have been on a slightly directional board because I wasn't riding coolars switch, you know, but it's, you know, you, you, you kind of, I just really recommend those directional shapes and slicing up just a little bit. All right. Any other questions here specifically on uh, choosing a board? Keep them coming in. So I got, I'm five, seven is a one fifty five too small. Um, that really depends on your weight, Patrick. Um, so it's, you know, weight, I would say, you know, a lot of people, we say size up to here and that's just kind of a general rule. Really, it's, it's you should be thinking about your weight. And if you're 145, I, I think that 155 is fine for you as long as it's a slightly directional board. If it's a twin, you know, it's, it's also probably fine. I ride a 155 twin on resort, and I weigh 175, and I'm 5'11". Awesome. All right, let's keep moving here, guys. Thanks for all the um, chiming in and the questions. You guys are awesome. Yeah, guides, feel free to answer those questions in the comments as we go too. Thank you. So we're going to touch on bindings now, and this is going to be a really fun discussion because <laughs> there's people from every uh, field of thought in this conversation right now. So there's a lot of great brands out there. You know, the ones we really like and work with a ton are Spark, Caracorum, and Phantom. Uh, you know, we also test out other products on all of our boards. I have a pair of the Unions. I've tried the Bollets and the Plums. Uh, Things to keep in mind, you know, that, that pucks are something that you need to buy with your bindings in certain cases. Some other bindings don't have pucks, right? You need to be thinking about how they tour up and how they ride down, um, not just how they ride down or just how they tour up. Um, and we recommend kind of bringing a scraper with you to, to scrape off ice and things. But I'm going to kick it over to a couple of the guides that, that have kind of um, strong recommendations on these products. So, um, Pat, I know that, that you really like your spark setup. Could you give us a few reasons that you like your spark findings? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the biggest reasons is they're just uh, simple. Simple and easy to use. I like the puck system um, that uh, spark bindings use. Um, they're very durable. They have a great uh, high back system, uh, easy to find parts, and they have a great customer service. Um, for me, they're just simple, and I like simple products that are robust and that's kind of what it what they come down to sweet awesome thank you and we've got josh jesperson here too i know you ride caracorum josh do you have any notes on caracorum why you tend to like caracorum over you know any anything else yeah absolutely um can you turn my camera on ben sure. uh, i mean first one thing about caracorum is they have a uh, lifetime crash replacement policy so basically they don't want you buying new bindings every year or every other year. Um, um, if you have a binding that has a strap blown out or a couple screws need fixed, what they'll do is you can send them in and uh, get it fixed. So that's pretty awesome for a very nominal fee. Um, is my camera up? I can't yep, tell. You're on. Cool. One other sweet thing about the Caracorum is 
Here's the binding plate. It's on, binding's on, that easy, that simple. One other cool thing about that simplicity, I'm in tour mode, that Ooh. easy, that quick. So it used to be, you know, thought that Karakorms are really complicated, over-engineered. Um, they've got past that stage in their development and they're so far now that they are so simple and easy to use, very mindless, don't even really need a scraper 99% of the time. Killer. And the, awesome. glitch, the crash replacement is kind of one of the biggest things too. Sweet. And then we've also got, you know, some phantom guys, some hard booters in here. So we'll touch on hard booting a little bit more, but um, Cody, you're, you're a, a phantom ambassador, I believe. Why don't you give us, a, a, you know, your insight into phantom and hard boot bindings? Yeah, uh, of course. Um, if you don't mind turning on my video real yep, quick. Gotcha. So, um, yeah, a couple of things in the Phantom is like um, the simplicity of use. Um, I like that um, for one, hold on real quick, start my video. Um, so with the Phantom binding, here it is here. It's like one of my favorite things about the Phantom is as you can see here is that the canted on the binding. And so um, I used to use the Sparks, and I really uh, like the Sparks. Um, and the one thing I um, like is, of course, that the bindings, as long as the spark, go in your backpack. So it takes some of the weight off of your foot as you're going uphill. And, you know, the old saying is like, you know, a pound off your foot is like a 10 pounds or a pound off your foot is like 10 pounds off your back or whatever. But, like, basically, I, um, I like the way that these clips go together. Um, they pull the binding together. Um, I'm really psyched on... Uh, my buddy wrote, uh, can you hang on here? But I really, <laughs> which is kind of stupid, but I really like the link lever system that Phantom has come out with. It allows for that forward flex. Um, they send you a, um, a few different springs depending on your weight. Um, and I like the simplicity of use. I think uh, the Phantom setup, when you put the bindings on, it really kind of pulls the board together a bit more um, as opposed to uh, sliding the binding on. Um, I have found and uh, and yeah, it's like, you know, with whatever setup you use, it's nice to be able to buy that setup and be able to use that setup for five to 10 years, you know? And I feel like with the Phantoms or with the Sparks or with whatever setup you use, make sure that it's durable um, and that, you know, you're not gonna have to buy bindings every single year. And I would also highly recommend with whatever binding setup that you do choose to get, whether it be a soft boot or a hard boot setup, uh, once you get everything dialed, whether with the link levers and also with the bindings, lock tight everything. So lock tight your toes, lock tight your heel pucks, um, because the last thing that you want is to be in the field and to have some screws uh, work loose and um, you be on the top of the peak and be missing the screws. So uh, make sure and just like lock tight everything on your bindings. That way you don't, um, you know, find yourself in that predicament. Uh, predicament. But uh, I've been very psyched with the with the Phantom setup so far. Uh, so far with the, it's just very lightweight and allows me to go, um, you know, a little bit further and farther and. Maybe maybe a little bit less energy, but, uh, but yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that is awesome feedback. And yeah, on top of that, you know, like Cody says, you can use Loctite or, you know, just make sure you're checking your hardware every time you go out. Make sure you have a full repair kit for these bindings, right? Um, I bet you everyone on this call, um, all these panelists have written at least one line uh, put together with ski straps and or zip ties. Uh, more than they would like to admit. I know, I, I, you know, I've, I've ridden a couple lines with zip ties and, you know, now I carry a full repair kit. Um, and it's a lesson that we would love for you guys to just listen to us on instead of learn like we learned. Um, you know, get a good repair kit, get good spare parts for whatever bindings that you have, right? So I personally ride Phantoms. I have a pair of Unions. I've ridden Karakorums and, and I ride Sparks. I really think that, you know, all these products are, are really well made and, and good to go, especially the Spark Karakorum Phantom. Um, I have a pair of the union bindings as well, just to kind of test and, and try to help develop any chance we get. Um, and what I'll say about the unions is they're a great cost effective option. Um, you know, if you've got 300 bucks and that, that's all you can do to get into split boarding, it's probably not the sport for you, but the union is a great option. And if you really like the, the feel of a union binding on a resort, that union binding might be something you want, you know, to, to go into the back country. But I, I think you kind of heard the recommendations from the guides. So we'll just leave it at that. Um, and then split board boots. You know, this is another question that, that I really get a lot. Um, do I need split board boots, right? And so I, I put this in the category for new split boarders that you do not need split board boots. 
if if you know you've already got a pair of boots that are that are nice and comfortable right so that's the main thing that you're comfortable right if you have you know hot spots and, and you know uh, just issues while you're hiking or touring it's not going to be a fun day so and it's that can can ruin your day having a boot that's uncomfortable right so it's you really want to think about that um and if you are in the market for a splitboard boot there there's a lot of great ones that are out there right so um, you know, Fitwell makes a fantastic boot. Deluxe, 32, Fitwell, K2. Oh, I got Fitwell in there twice. Um, they're, they're so great, I guess. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, I own a pair of K2 Aspects. I really, um, you know, I like them. Again, I, I really tell people don't buy a splitboard boot unless you really need a splitboard boot, right? Um, and the 32 boot, I know a ton of guys who ride the 32 I know a lot of guys that ride the Solomon. I know a lot of guys that ride the K2. I know a few guys that ride the Deluxes, but kind of what I've seen is the overwhelming majority of kind of advanced splitboarders that are riding, still riding a soft booter in the Fitwells. So um, I know a few of the guys on here ride Fitwells. Um, Josh, do you want to, you know, talk about Fitwells at all here? Yeah, totally. And I'll even refer to uh, Justin and Pat a little bit. Um, yep. But, you know, Fitwells are really great because they let you kind of break into more splitboard mountaineering. Um, they've got a really reliable shank on the boot that lets you feel comfortable on ice on your front points. And at the end of the day, the biggest thing with splitboard boots that I think you should strive for is durability. Um, so, like, Benny mentioned the K2 aspects, and here's my old aspects. <laughs> I don't know if everybody can see that. That's my hand coming out of there. And that's after one season on these boots. Granted, I walk a lot more on really shitty conditions, but, you know, still at the end of the day, you want durability. Um, yep. And I think Justin and Pat have been riding years and years on the fit wells that they have. So if you guys want to comment on that as well. Sure. Yeah, this is Pat. Um, I like the fit wells because they're essentially a mountain boot that is a, a snowboard boot. Um, and that's important for me. I gravitate towards lines that require uh, mixed climbing. Um, and so having a boot that uh, takes a crampon really reliably and has that stiff shank is, is really important. Um, I think with any boot, uh, it's important to just dial a liner too. I don't use the stock liner in my Fitwell and, and never have. I use the Intuition Pro Tour. Um, so something to consider with any boot that's going to be more stiff or harder to break in like the Fitwell is, is just dialing a good liner especially heat molding it awesome yeah i would agree real quick i've had these boots for i would probably say easily over 400 days most durable boot i've ever had the only issue of course like pat said changing the liners but literally that's the only thing i've had happen on these boots in 400 plus days i'm not a big dude but the most durable boot i've ever had and that is why I, this is a soft boot that i personally choose that's a big difference between my K2 aspect, Justin. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> oh, my God. Awesome. Just, well, thanks for that feedback, guys. Ben, uh, can I add something about hard boots there? Send it. Uh, we're, yeah, we're going to discuss hard boots here in a second. Cool. But I, I just I see the common theme of durability, and that's one of the main advantages of hard booting is you don't have to worry about that line of breaking down as often. Um, you can just replace the, the liner if it becomes uh, packed out, you know? Yeah, that's right. So I think that's a perfect intro to hard boots, right? So a lot of the, the, the reasons people move to hard boots, and, and when I say hard boots, this just, you know, is a, an Alpine Tele ski boot, right? Or an AT boot, right? So this is just something that people are, uh, you know, using to go split boarding in. Why? Because they're built for walking. And you can argue that, you know, unless there's a lot of articulation in a soft boot, um, you know, that they're just not built for walking, you know. And so that's kind of the, the argument there is, you know, durability, you know, but also built for walking. So those are the kind of the, the neat things about hard boots, right? So it's, you're able to kind of modify these things if you want. Um, but it's, I ride a pair of Atomic Backlands and I didn't mod them for a couple of years and really liked them stock, you know, and there's a lot of, um, benefits like full auto crampon compatibility, uh, you know, the Dina fit toe pieces, the, you know, specific hard boot bindings that can save a ton of weight. Um, I, I've just seen a lot of benefits for, for riding hard boots. So I'll open it up to a couple of our team riders here, you know, Cody Hughes, 
Uh, Will Sperry, you guys, you know, tell us what you think uh, here about hard boots. And, you know, again, uh, the, the two different systems out there, Will, I'll let you talk a little bit about the Spark system too, since we didn't go over that any. Um, but, you know, there's Phantom, there's Spark, and those are kind of the, the two hard boot companies. But I'll let you, I'll let Cody talk about kind of the Phantom and like how he likes it, you know, with his boot. And Will, you can talk about the, uh, the Spark Dyno system. Cool. Yeah, so for me, it's like, um, so first of all, it's range of motion. Like having a 60 to 65 degree range of motion when you're walking uphill is like absolutely incredible. So let's break this up into like one uphill and two downhill. So let's start with uphill. First, you have the like the, the range of motion, you know, and that's like absolutely incredible for skinning uphill. You're going to get more glide, especially when you have a kind of a, a mohair skin, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. Um, you have better ankle articulation. So when you're side hilling, especially on days like today where um, the mountains haven't seen a lot of fresh snow and you have, you know, variable snow conditions on your ascent. Um, and so you're actually able to keep an edge where on a soft boot, you know, um, you're going to break down over time. And, you know, I'm not, I only use the fit wells for a very limited time. And so I'm not going to speak to those, but I did use soft boots for a very long time. And I went through one pair of soft boots every single season. Sometimes I actually went through a pair of soft boots on every like two or three months um, because I mean, um, I'm fortunate enough to, this is my career. So I snowboard every day and I just break those things down over time because the fabric is, that's just the nature of that fabric. It's not a plastic. It's going to break down over time. And so over 90 days or hundred days of snowboarding, that fabric is going to break down. Whereas this boot, I can get three to five years out of, which is super nice. Um, also on the uphill is like booty, like boot packing uphill. There's been many times where like, you know, you would definitely need a crampon on your foot if you were a soft booter. And if you are going to be on soft boots, you, I, I would say that if you are planning on putting crampons on your feet with a soft boot, you need to make sure that at least has, I'm just going to use this for example, but that welt on the back. Um, I have climbed uh, a couple lines in uh, my career where I had a, I had a binding or excuse me, a crampon like come off on a very steep slope. And it is like, I actually had to build a quick anchor with an ice ax to get my crampon back on my salt boot. And it was quite terrifying. And so just making sure that you have that ability to, um, you know, like, you know, put, put a crampon on your salt boot and make sure that it's tight. Um, and, and, you know, I think the biggest thing for, people that are on the, on the verge of going hard boot um, from soft boots is that they're really worried about the downhill ability. And I think what Phantom has done with the link lever system, allowing for that articulation forward and allowing to be able to adjust your high back, just like you're able to do on your soft boot, I really think it's a game changer. Um, it has allowed me to, um, I don't feel like it has personally taken away any of my downhill ability. And I still like, you know, a lot of, uh, folks at soft boot and that I tour with and that I'm like, you know, I totally agree with. But um, for me, it's like, like boot packing up a ridge or like being able to just being able to like click your toes out and not have your bindings flailing all over the place and being able to put them up your, over your shoulder and walk uphill really quickly. And then, you know, quick transitions um, has been really nice. Uh, awesome. And, yeah. Awesome. Um, Will, do you want to talk about the spark system at all? I think a lot of people maybe aren't familiar with that, but it's similar to just a base plate that slides onto the pucks and locks totally. you into your, your hard boot binding. So, yeah. And it's kind of funny. All the reasons that Cody uh, spoke about that he liked the phantom bindings are kind of the same reasons I like the spark bindings. Yeah. Um, I like how you can get the canted pucks to put on your board. Um, and it just comes down to simplicity, like the, the least amount of moving parts, uh, the better when you're in the back country and you know, if something does break, it's easier to fix. Um, but really it's just like uh, a simple lever type system, almost like a fully auto cramp on and uh, they're great. You know, not awesome. much, not much more than that. Yep. I've ridden both the, the phantoms and the dinos and I like them both. Uh, you know, I really didn't notice, you know, a ton of difference. I think the phantoms maybe are a little closer to the board. That's the main thing I noticed, but. I really like both those systems. So I'm going to quickly go through skins right now. Um, we're not going to get into really a ton of a depth on skins. I think we all have lots of different um, opinions, but obviously buy split board specific skins for your board to make sure you take time when you trim them. Uh, the metal edges should be showing. There's lots of good YouTube videos out there. Buy your local shop employee a six pack. 
uh, we really, you know, recommend a nice mohair mix. Um, you know, um, I've, I've ridden all kinds of different skins and, you know, guides type in any skins that you recommend into the, the chat, please. Um, I do prefer tail clips as well. <laughs> um, and tips, you know, fold your skins in quarters, glue to glue, use the skin saver when you're storing long term. I like to put my uh, skins in the, the crisper. I don't have an air conditioner in my house. So I like keeping my skins cold over the summer. Uh, you know, make sure that they're nice and clean. You don't have any snow or ice when you're sticking them on. Make sure when you take them off, you don't toss them in the snow. Maybe you're going to use them again. Keep a couple skin straps just in case, um, or a couple boilet straps just in case. Um, you know, carry skin wax. That's like my biggest tip. Um, if you're not familiar with skin wax, Google it. Um, if you rub it on your skins to keep snow from sticking to them in the spring, uh, they're awesome. You know, so make sure you always, I always have skin wax with me. Um, and don't get your skins, you know, in high heat. Don't let, put them right next to the fire. Don't leave them in your car. Uh, you know, just, yeah. So a lot, lot of different tips there. Um, any questions that we haven't addressed um, on bindings, boots, skins? I think we had a, a lot of good conversation there. Let me scroll through. I think I saw one. And Weston is planning on making our own skins in the next year. So, so stay tuned. Uh, to look for those. We've been working with Pomoka a little bit here, and that is on the horizon. So awesome. All right, we're going to continue on here. I'm going to open it up to Pat Gephardt of Colorado Adventure Guides, Colorado Snowboard Guides, uh, one of the first guides we brought on, and, and just an awesome guy. He's going to discuss some, some Avi gear and first aid before we open it up to Justin. Well, oh, great, guys. Uh, avalanche gear, you know, part of the entire splitboard setup uh, is how you want to think of it. Something we don't go into the backcountry without. Um, so Beacon Shovel Probe are the main items we're going to be using. Um, and with beacons, you know, uh, some of the important takeaways are just getting a three antenna beacon. All the new modern beacons out there are going to be three antenna. Uh, keep the batteries fresh. Uh, I don't like to get, get the battery level below maybe 60, 70 percent. Um, and don't use lithium ion. They're not going to perform well in the cold weather. So only using alkaline uh, batteries is important. But the real uh, important thing with a beacon is knowing how to use yours. Um, you say you're at the trailhead and you forget your beacon. Maybe your buddy has uh, one that you can borrow. If you're not familiar with the beacon model, it might not be that great to, uh, to go ahead and use it. So just being familiar with your beacons because they all kind of function a bit differently. Uh, shovel, just get an Abbey specific one, buy one from a reputable brand, collapsible one has to be metal, so no plastic. Um, the larger the shovel, uh, the, the more snow it's going to displace quicker. Um, and also there's some shovels out there that have, say, a hoe mode, which can be used in strategic shoveling situations. Um, but again, get a shovel that works for you. And then the probe itself, uh, we like a nice 300 centimeter minimal in length. The longer, the better. Um, just going to be more effective than a deeper burial. Uh, get a probe with visible markings. Um, that's going to tell you the depth at which the, the person's buried. But I use my probe all the time just to find out where the deep snow is, especially in the uh, thin snowpack we have here in Colorado, especially early season. So uh, probes are much are pretty useful other than avalanche rescue as well. Um, the most important thing about all this gear though is knowledge of how to use them. Um, knowledge of avalanche self-rescue, um, making sure your partners know avalanche rescue as well. Um, so going out there and practicing, hitting up the beacon park, uh, burying beacons, burying beacons, um, just getting out there and using your beacon each season. Any questions on that? Okay, great. Yeah. All right, and that brings us to airbags. Um, so airbag packs can be a good complement uh, to basic avalanche safety, um, but there's a lot of considerations with them. Um, type of system, compressed air, nitrogen or fan. So uh, with the compressed and nitrogen uh, systems, um, they're going to have, be a one and done system. So if you trigger uh, your avalanche air bag, it's done for the, uh, until you fill it back up with an electric fan. Um, they have multiple deployments um, in terms of travel compatibility. You know, uh, as, as 
from what I know uh, with uh, uh, traveling with compressed, uh, you have to have the uh, bottle have no air in it. Um, with say an electric fan, um, you could certainly travel with one like that. Uh, packs that have a removable airbag system are great if you don't want to ride with it for whatever reason, uh, get your pack a little less heavy. Um, and then just getting one with the correct size and weight, uh, airbag packs typically have the system itself take up a lot of room in the pack. Um, so it might be prudent to get a bit bigger of a pack than you may think you need. Um, get one that you're actually going to use. So, you know, those 20 liter airbag packs out there, you know, they're great for heli skiing. Are you going to be able to fit all your stuff uh, for a day in the back country? Probably not. Um, but yeah, just go ahead and just research uh, ones, check them out in shops. Um, but we just want to remember that airbags aren't a substitute for problem proper avalanche education skills, and they shouldn't dictate the terrain you ride. You shouldn't be thinking about that when you drop into a, a specific line. Uh, if the airbag is going to make your thinking change, um, you might not want to use one. Great, and that brings us uh, to first aid and rescue. So uh, real quickly, let's take a, a poll here. Who has um, had first aid training before? All right, looks like most people here have taken at least a CPR first aid course or uh, we got a few woofers in the house too, a lot of woof buzz too. The Wilderness First Aid is a great new course that's come out in the past few years and awesome guys. Great to see here. Looks like a lot of us are taking a lot of first aid courses. Fantastic. All right, Pat, I'll let you uh, continue on here. Great. Um, first aid, super important for the backcountry. Uh, the more days you spend in the backcountry, the more likely you're going to have an accident out there. Um, so knowing, uh, having basic knowledge of wilderness first aid um, and being self-sufficient in the backcountry is super important. So we recommend having a, a wilderness first aid or even better a wilderness first responder uh, certification. Um, Knowles teaches them uh, right here in Breckenridge. Our local community college teaches uh, the course. Um, almost there's so many uh, providers out there that you can take one through and they're great courses to teach you wilderness medicine. Um, Self-sufficiency is huge. If something does go wrong in the backcountry and you need to call search and rescue, they're not going to be there for hours. Um, so knowing a basic life-saving saving techniques um, in the backcountry is very important. Um, we don't want to leave our first aid uh, kit at home uh, simply because uh, it maybe it weighs too much. We always want to have some kind of first aid kit. Um, accidents do happen and yeah, there's no ski patrol in the backcountry. Um, in terms of first aid kits, I recommend just checking out a wilderness first responder kind of uh, list is a great start. Um, better yet, take the class. Um, but if you're looking to build a first aid kit, that's a great starting point. Um, we like Sam Splint uh, out there for splinting in the backcountry. We also just chatted about a Threadworks one, one to check out. Maybe you can ask some of our other guides. Um, in the, uh, the chat. Um, I'm always going to have a spot or Garmin in reach. That's part of the medical kit right there. Um, being able to contact uh, emergency medical services when you don't have cell reception is very important. Um, we like to also have a bivy that doub doubles as a rescue sled. If we got to spend the night out, if we got to pull somebody out of the backcountry, a great tool to have. And of course, lots of ski, tr ski straps, maybe along with some cordelette. Um, some climbing tape I like to have, some uh, a nice roll of, of duct tape is also great to have in the backcountry. Yeah, and I'll let any of our other uh, guides chime in of, of what they might like. I mean, here it's Cody. I, 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 I think one of the most important things um, is definitely having, having that uh, first aid kit, but like that bivy that doubles as a rescue sled um, down in the protest, that's great. It's like so important and like don't think of it as like you're gonna drag your buddy like five miles or something to a trailhead. Think of it as like being able to drag your buddy to a landing zone that a helicopter can get to. You know, like 
just have some type of tarp and rope system, like 30 meters of like four to five mil cord that like, you know, you can make as a rescue sled. Use YouTube uh, to figure out how to make that rescue sled, but be able to somehow at least move your buddy out of avalanche terrain um, into an area that a helicopter or a rescue crew that's gonna come in by foot can get to you. Um, in my opinion is super important. And lastly would be that spot or garment in reach. Here in the Wasatch, uh, here in Utah, we are very, very lucky to have like a cell phone service in a lot of areas, but I do still carry um, a Garmin in reach um, because um, yeah, I, I actually had a friend pass away in the Tetons and um, if, if they would have had a Garmin in reach, that might not have happened. And so being able to get that SOS out and to be able to send that two-way text messaging those two pieces of equipment, I would, um, along with your first aid kit, or something, I think would just get fun. Awesome. Um, and you guys, this is a giant bivy that I carry. It's uh, a Peeps multifunction, lightweight bivy sack, bivouac bag, single. Um, what's cool about it is it has little eyelets, so you can make a rescue sled out of it. So. Um, Peeps makes one of those. Awesome. I also carry a, a spot um, or actually a Garmin in reach every time I go into the backcountry. Um, I think it's just very important to have that ability to contact people to let people know what's going on, whether it's, hey, I'm late or, hey, you know, we actually had an issue here or, hey, I need someone here right now. And this is why. I like that two way communication. It's pretty important for me. All right, any questions on um, AVI gear or first aid? Uh, let me see, I saw a few come in there. I got the what brand of rescue sled I have. But yeah, I think the, the overwhelming thing right there is, you know, you can have a first aid kit, but if you don't know how to use it, it's kind of like AVI gear, right? Like you need to know how to use these things. And when I took my woofer years ago, what I, what I learned is it gave me confidence. It, it, it gave me the confidence to not freak out if someone breaks their leg in the backcountry. I'm able to just calmly go, okay, you know, like I know what to do and freaking out isn't going to help. And it's, you practice it so much in a woofer class that like you understand uh, how to do that stuff. And it, you're calm, cool, and collected in the event of an emergency, which is really important, you know? So d just everybody having a first aid kit doesn't matter if, if no one has that knows how to actually do first aid, right? And I do, I recommend that InReach Mini. I think that's pretty cool too, because it can, you can use your phone with it. I also have the big Garmin. Um, yeah. I also have the big Garmin um, yeah, InReach that, that I really like. And you can use this as a standalone device, which is what's nice. Um, I don't need my cell phone, right? I can, I can two-way message people wherever I'm at using this. Um, but like, you know, it's, I often connect it and pair it with my iPhone so I can actually use the GPS feature and the texting feature through my phone. So as long as you, you know, have your phone, you're able to keep it charged. That InReach mini is a great, you know, a lot more affordable option and probably at the top of my recommendation myth, uh, list for those. And then for first aid kits, you know, I think starting with an adventure medical kit is great. And then supplementing it with that SAM splint or that Threadwork splint or those things that, you know, you learned in your woofer class that go above and beyond that little first aid kit that you can buy anywhere, right? I think my favorite thing with the Garmin InReach Explorer as opposed to the InReach Mini is that I can download the maps to my Explorer. Yep. So being able to like be on a glacier or be in like bigger mountains that you're not familiar with and navigate via you're in reach because let's be realistic, like your phone's probably gonna die in one of those situations. Yep. So you're not gonna be able to navigate via your phone. So what I always do is I have a paper map. I also have my phone map, but then I triple back it up with my Garmin inReach map. And then, you know, the Garmin inReach Explorer is gonna be able to hold battery for a lot longer than my, my mobile device. Yep. Um, and I actually, that came in handy on Denali last year um, where I was able to navigate to a camp uh, with run out zones that I had had already predetermined on my in reach where my phone was dead and a paper map doesn't do me much good when I can barely see my hand in front of my face. So um, spending that little bit of extra money to get that in reach and a little um, explore 
um, and a little bit extra weight with that Explorer as opposed to the Mini um, was really nice in that situation. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, we had a, we had a comment um, from the Weston management team that says it really helps out with his home life when he can let, let his wife know that he's going to be missing dinner because his snowmobile is stuck in a ditch. I don't have any experience with that, though. I'm always home on time. So I'll next, say, oh, go ahead. Uh, just one more plus for the Reach Mini. The first day I ever use it, I like activated the subscription the night before, went to climb this route in the Eastern Sierra. And uh, this dude that we ran into, not part of our party, uh, took a, a leader climber fall and shattered his ankle. And we called a helicopter for him literally the first day I got it. So yeah. Uh, I'm a huge big huge and that's a lot of times i i carry mine too for that very reason because there's so many other people out there for you sure. know uh, free like at least five times i've been called into a rescue situation that involved not somebody in my party yep. right but i was still had that communication i was able to provide that level of safety for other people which isn't ideal but it, it was they were pretty damn happy right sure. you know that, that somebody else was out there so yep. that's great all right guys um Without any further ado, we're going to open it up to Justin Ibarra. Um, we're going to have an in-depth discussion on gear. You guys feel free to run to the fridge, grab another beer. Um, this is going to be kind of the meat of the presentation. Um, and then after that, we'll open it up to kind of a final Q&A. So again, thank you guys for all tuning in tonight. We really do appreciate it. Um, you know, community involvement, spreading this knowledge is a big part of who we are. And it really does mean, means a lot for you guys to, to chime in right now. And and tune into this awesome uh, discussion with these guys. So Dustin, I will kick it over to you. Um, and yeah, keep those questions coming, guys. We'll probably address the questions more at the end and let Justin get through all this awesome gear. Thanks again. Sweet, right on guys. Well, first off, thanks for tuning in. Stoked to see everybody here. Um, we're gonna go over the pack, uh, the gear list that we're kind of looking at on the slideshow here. Um, and we did cover a decent amount of this stuff already through the presentation. Um, so we might breeze through some stuff, go into detail on others. So, but we're going to start out with layering um, and we're, we're kind of going to cover gear from head to toe here. So layering is pretty important um, when we're in the back country, temperature regulation is key. And so we want to be able to regulate our temperature via the layering system. Um, so we like to teach the three part layering system. And so that three part system, the first one is going to be a base layer followed by an insulating layer, and then your, uh, your outer layer is gonna be your shell. So I do have some examples just laid out here. We're gonna quickly go over. So again, your first line of defense is gonna be your base layer. First and foremost, for any kind of layering, you do not really wanna wear cotton. Um, cotton loses, in, loses its warming properties once it becomes wet. I'm sure you guys may have heard the same cotton kills. Um, so the best material you're gonna be looking for is gonna be um, wool, synthetics like nylon, poly, pro, um, silk, um, that spandex, that kind of line of things here. So just an example, your base layer is going to be something that's going to be more of a form fitting tighter. And so you definitely want to have a top and a bottom base layer. Um, this is an example of just a nylon t-shirt kind of depending upon season. Um, you might want a t-shirt as well, as well. So that kind of hits your ba uh, base layering system. Your next system is going to be your insulating system. So that's going to be something like a fleece, light fleece. Um, again, just reiterating, don't wear any cotton. Um, and then your last line of defense um, is going to be your shell. And then I guess in the middle of there, you might throw in like a light insulating layer. Um, and then your shell, kind of like a lightweight, really doesn't have to have too much to it. And again, the big takeaway on the gear side of things is temperature regulation. So you want to be able to add layers and drop layers based on how hot you're getting on your tour. Um, and when we're touring the backcountry, it's a lot different than going on the resort. And so um, you're going to be pretty hot when you're going uphill, um, extending a lot of energy. And so when you're going uphill, you might want like a baseball cap or a light beanie. Uh, typically, it's not really good to tour with your helmet on. You're just going to be sweating it out. Um, goggles, similarly, typically you're just going to be sweating that out. So you're going to want to shoot for sunglasses as well. Um, so kind of top to bottom again, sunglasses, hat, maybe a buff, um, and your base layer systems, of course, wool socks, even with your underwear, really you shouldn't be wearing cotton. So some sort of synthetic underwear as well. Um, and that kind of hits your, your layering. Um, again, feel free to ask any questions 
in the, the chat there. But again, uh, base layers, insulating layer in your shell. So cool. So we're going to keep trucking along here. Um, pull some stuff off this guy. Uh, now that we covered the layering, I'll go over some of the hard gear here. Uh, before I get in my backpack, we already did talk about split boards. We talked about bindings. We talked about skins. Uh, we didn't necessarily talk about poles yet. Uh, for poles for split boarding, you're going to want a three-piece pole or at least a three-piece pole. My personal recommendation is the Black Diamond Expedition with the flick lock here. I'm not personally a huge fan of the Z-poles because I've seen them break a lot in the background through with clients and friends and so forth. So uh, some of the guides might have some other recommendations, but my personal recommendation is your three-piece expedition pole here with that flick lock. So that kind of hits your poles. Um, and then we already talked about boots as well. So the next thing we'll get into is our actual backpack and the stuff is inside of our backpack. So your backpack itself is super important. There's a lot of different models, a lot of different manufacturers out there. Um, I'm not going to say one's better than others. It's kind of personal preference. But what you want to do is make sure that you have a snow sport specific backpack. Uh, snow sport specific backpack is a backpack that is made for winter backcountry travel. It's going to have a pocket dedicated for all your avalanche gear. And then when we're beyond that, you're going to be looking at sizing. Um, again, touring in the backcountry, we do have a lot more gear versus, say, going out on the ski resort. Um, and so for sizing, we typically recommend 30 liters or more. That we have enough space to put all your gear on. Ideally, you really don't want anything on the outside of your backpack for most tours, minus maybe your helmet or your poles for the downhill. And then when you get into spring tours, maybe your ice axe. Um, again, we ideally want to keep our gear contained to the backpack. You risk losing it. So shovels on the outside, probes on the outside, those are life-saving pieces of equipment. We want to make sure all that stuff is inside of your backpack here. So again, a lot of different kinds out there. Everybody has their own preference. Get a snow sport specific pack and get 30 liter plus. That way you can fit everything in there. So uh, cool. So beyond the backpack, guys, the other important thing about it is that you organize your backpack. Organization is crucial. Um, everything needs to have a home and that's where it lives. So that when you need something, you know exactly where to go to get it. You're sitting on the top of a ridge and you're in 50 mile an hour winds in a whiteout. You're not having to pull and scramble through your whole backpack just to find your water bottle or some food. So once you get a pack, if you haven't already, organize it, get a home for something and that's the only spot where it lives. So personally, I already know where everything lives in this backpack. I just have a mental picture because that's the only spot that it lives. So we're gonna kind of go over it now. I'll do a little bit of a pack blowout here. So first and foremost, I'll go over some of the Avalanche gear. This is an Ortovox pack right here. I'm a huge fan of Ortovox. This is a, actually a 45 liter backpack, but I have enough room in here to carry all my spring touring stuff in here as well. Um, so first and foremost, I have my dedicated Avalanche gear pocket here. You can see it's marked by a red zipper. If I forget, I open it up and nothing is in the way of my Avalanche gear here. So your shovel and your probe need to be able to be accessed right away. So shovel, pull that out here real quick. Uh, Pat did a good job about explaining your shovel. Just quickly, a few takeaways on here. Make sure you get a metal shovel, not a plastic shovel. A little bit bigger of a blade is going to be better or more efficient for moving snow than a smaller blade. Um, a longer telescoping handle, of course, is better than a smaller one, just more efficient. We've also found that the D handle has been one of the most efficient handles you're going to get. And then there's some shovels that have a special mode, um, like this hoe mode right here, which is super efficient for moving snow in different scenarios here. So that kind of hits our shovel. Again, a lot of models, a lot of manufacturers out there. Metal, bigger blades, better, longer telescoping handle, and a D handle, we found it to be the most efficient. So that kind of hits our shovel there. Next thing in here is going to be my probe. Again, Pat kind of already covered a lot of information on the probe here. Um, again, just a few takeaways on here. This is live life-saving pieces of equipment. There's no reason to skimp. So you're going to find different lengths, typically 240 centimeters to 320 plus. And just as Pat mentioned, there's no reason to get a shorter probe. It's better to have it and not need it and need it and not have it. A lot of people think, oh, I'm in Colorado. It's a continental snow pack. It's not that deep. I'll get a shorter probe. And then what happens when you get in a terrain trap or a deep burial, then you don't have enough probes. So again, longer is going to be better. And then you're going to see three main materials of these probes. You're going to find aluminum, 
carbon and steel, and they're kind of in order of least durable to most durable. And again, these are life-saving pieces of equipment. And then you're gonna see different thicknesses up here. Of course, thicker is gonna be a little bit better than thinner. You're also gonna see a different material running through the probe itself. You'll find cable and you'll find string. What do you think is gonna be more durable? Probably the cable. Again, life-saving pieces of equipment here. So, and then I'm a huge fan of a probe that has really easy to read visual markings on it as well. So that kind of hits the probe. So that hits the avalanche gear that's in here, my probe, my shovel. I use this pocket for the rest of my emergency equipment as well. So continuing in this pocket, we're gonna find my first aid kit. Dave Pat did a good job going over first aid kit. If you wanna know what to put in your first aid kit, just do a quick Google search. Find a wilderness first aid, a wilderness first responder recommended first aid kit. Um, so I'm not gonna dive too much into that. First aid kit, super important. I wouldn't say necessarily everybody in your touring group needs to have a first aid kit, but you need to make sure you have a first aid kit that's adequate for the group size. Super, super important. So that kind of hits our first aid. And then delving on down here, I do also carry a snow saw in this pocket. I use this for doing snow study and you can use it for emergency shelter construction or someone makes mad. All right, and then as well in the bottom of this pocket. This is my repair kit here, all right? So since we didn't really go over the repair kit, I'm gonna pop this guy open real quick and quickly go over what I have in here. First and foremost, I have a ski strap on the outside. Ski strap is the duct tape of the backcountry. So I won't go to the backcountry usually without at least five, six of the ski straps here. So if you don't know what a ski strap is, this guy right here. You can use it for almost anything and everything. All right, so I'm gonna delve into my repair kit. Similarly, I wouldn't say everybody in your repair kit, or excuse me, everybody in your group needs a repair kit, but you do need one adequate for group size and for everybody's mode of travel, super important. So this is just what I carry my first aid, or excuse me, my repair kit, um, and some of the guides can again chime in if they have anything different. So first and foremost, you need to make sure you can replace or fix most stuff on your bindings. Um, I am a spark rider, so I carry pretty much all the screws, all the ladder straps, all the buckles that I would need to fix a spark binding in here. Continuing in here, again, I have a few more ski straps in here. I have them throughout my backpack. I have three in my repair kit, and I keep two more easily accessible that I can use throughout the day. Batteries, you need to make sure you have spare batteries. You're going to be best off carrying both alkaline or about both AAA as well as AA. Skin wax, glob stopper, toilet paper, and fire starter, and a lighter. One of the 10 essentials. Duct tape. Some small cordelette shoestrings. I have a handful of zip ties. Some emergency food. A buckle, a whistle. Definitely get a whistle in your repair kit. Okay, probably a second to the radio. I'm sure you guys have yelled in trees and been 10 feet away and not been able to hear each other. Whistle is crucial. I carry some Gore-Tex repair tape and then some more tape and my chapstick here. So. That pretty much exhausts my repair kit there. Again, um, some other examples you might carry would be um, bailing wire. Um, I don't know, again, some of the other guides on here can chime in if they have anything else pertinent they wanna talk about. But that kinda hits my repair kit and a little emergency blanket in there as well. I'll always throw some zip ties in there. Yeah, I have, I have some zip ties, some little smaller ones, but a handful. Cool, so that kind of hits everything. It's in my, um, I like to think of it as my emergency response pouch. It has all my avalanche gear and it has all my first aid and my repair kit. All right, so continuing through my pack right here. I'll get into the brain. The brain is where I have some more used, easily accessible stuff. First and foremost, radio. Some of you guys have asked about a radio. I think I saw, I'm a huge fan of the BCA Lynx. 
Uh, I always push a radio over an airbag. Communication and teamwork are so important. There are two best friends in the backcountry. So into my brain, some more accessible stuff here. This is where I keep some of my gloves. So for gloves, you're gonna want a thinner glove for touring uphill. You want a thicker glove for riding downhill. Otherwise you'll risk sweating these out. So my gloves are up here. I have two other ski straps. These are the ones I use that I don't pull out of my uh, repair kit. Goggles, depending on the day. An extra little beanie. And this is also where I keep my lunch and food and snacks. The more accessible stuff is, the more apt you're going to use it. So snacks, food, water, if it's accessible, if it's more accessible, you're going to be more apt to drink it and eat it. So definitely want to do that. And then below my brain here, I have my Leatherman. I have a spotting scope. Here you are. Here's your spot. Easily accessible. Headlamp. And Leatherman. Continuing on down to the pack, I have this little pocket right here. Um, tomorrow, actually, hopefully you guys all tune in, and we're going to do a tour planning session, and it's going to be kind of more of uh, using online resources, but we can't always rely on technology, and so you always want to have map and compass, and so this is the sleeve for all of my maps. And then here, my hit pouch, again, easily accessible, is my compass. Now this thing probably gets used more than more than most things in my pack. This is the Sunto MC2. It's a compass with an inclinometer and it triples as my ski scraper. Woohoo! Multi tools in one. And those of you guys who have taken the avalanche courses know how important slope angles are. So this guy right here again, hip pocket, easily accessible, super important. Beyond that, in that pocket, I have this spark tool right here. I'm a fan of it personally. It's flat, it has all of the heads for a spark binding. And to tell you the truth, I'm not going to lie, I've actually fixed more ski bindings with this guy than I have split board bindings. Cool. And then to continue trucking on down, the rest of my pack down in here, I kind of organize it in uh, order of how often I use it. So the stuff I use more is towards the top and stuff I don't down towards the bottom here. So at the top of my back is usually going to be my skins if I am not touring. So just quickly to real time show you some skins if you've never seen them before. Here's a G3 skin. And again, I'm a huge fan of tail clips. I use both, um, but I like the tail clips personally. And I'm a personally just a good fan of a uh, Nice mohair nylon mix. So skins, followed by my helmet, my beanie, and my thicker riding gloves. Scrolling on down here, water bottle, it's always on the right side. I have a emergency pair of gloves here, a little bit bigger than my size so they can fit different friends and clientele if need be. And again, getting down into the stuff, hopefully I don't really have to use, but we did talk about a lot of this already. A bivy, a tarp. Recommend for tarp, just find a good sill tarp. It's a silicone nylon tarp. You can find them on Amazon. Um, and then definitely get a bivy. And you can use these in cordelette to improvise a sled. Otherwise, get a sled in here too. We already talked about some good um, options for that. Alpine Threadworks makes a good one out of Canada. Uh, Brooks Range used to make one. You might be able to find some used ones out there. Um, if you are in the market of building stuff, maybe you should make one. There's a market for it. And then at the very bottom of my pack is just some cordelette and some carabiners that I can use to make some sort of shelter or sled if I needed to. I carry three beaners, about 15 feet of cordelette, and a double sling here. So again, stuff down towards the bottom that I don't use too much. Everything I use more often is up at the top. Long story short, organize your pack. Everything has a home. That way, when you know when you want something, you know exactly where to go to get it. So that is pretty much it as far as daily touring gear. It's just a good rundown of 
what you should be carrying in the backcountry. It seems like it's a lot, but we we need to not be able to have to rely on outside help. So um, yeah, that's pretty much everything I bring into the backcountry every day. I'm going out regardless of the season. Other tours might dictate more gear. So for example, springtime, you might be carrying an ice axe, some crampons. Again, some of you guys asked about crampons earlier. Um, most full strap crampons will fit on your boot. You do just need to make sure you snug it down really tight. There's, there's pros and cons to everything, but I've gotten into some really, really um, heady terrain in strap crampons before. So they will work. There's just pros and cons. If you do have a, a split board specific boot with this heel welt, just like Cody said, you're gonna get a semi-automatic crampon. It'll fit on here much better. And then one thing that I actually will put in my backpack this time of year in spring are ski crampons. So there's some Spark R&D ski crampons right here. You definitely wanna have a pair of these, at least here in Colorado when we get into springtime. It makes a world of difference on a four wheel drive in the backcountry. And then if beyond that, other tours like multi-day trips, you're gonna want a bigger backpack, sleeping bag, sleeping pad, fuel, stove, and food and so forth. But this is just a good rundown on what kind of gear you're gonna to wanna to strive to make sure you have every day in the backcountry and a couple of other uh, equipment beyond that. So um, again, any of the other guys can feel free to chime in um, if they have anything else they wanna recommend. Awesome, buddy. Thanks so much, Justin. That was a, an awesome overview. Um, you guys type in any questions you have there. Justin, we had one question. Do you recommend a steel or a plastic water bottle and why? Good question. Um, I've always used plastic personally. I, I can't think of anything that would turn me one to turn me one way or the other personally. I, so I believe the the steel water bottles you could then you know purify water or you know heat up water. I just I'm rarely in that situation. I usually run a Nalgene um, or a nice collapsible water bottle. Um, I think is a great choice. But if you're if yep. you're out you know and if you're going pretty far, a, a steel water bottle might make sense just in case you know. But I think a lot of us don't mind melting snow and you know we probably wouldn't be too worried about that but it, that's something to consider and i think that's the justification behind having a steel one is you could um you know purify water right for sure i think a, a, a good tip that comes to my mind is with freezing um I'm not sure if it would freeze more in there um the bladders personally i've always had them freeze triple insulating those dang things um there's I don't have it with me, but there's an insulated Nalgene holder that I do use. And then sometimes as well, just keeping it upside down will keep it from freezing on the mouth. Cool, that's a great tip. Thank you. All right, guys, again, this, this backcountry packing list is available on our website. Um, we're gonna post this full discussion online. Um, but again, let us know if you got any other questions on gear. Um, we also had another question. Was that a leather mint that you pulled that out of your brain pocket? Yes. Just simple right. Leatherman. Yep, just your average Leatherman. I also yep. carry one of those as well. Sometimes like when you need a knife, you need a knife. When you need pliers, yeah. you need pliers. You yep. know, and it's yep. I, I've really I carry a really little Leatherman, but still like pliers or something mm -hmm. that, that I could really use. Yep. All right, guys, keep them coming. Um, if you have any questions, stay tuned. Uh, next week we are gonna host another talk on uh, Denali actually an expedition splitboarding. We're gonna try to keep these webinars going. Um, we're gonna keep uh, you know putting out education. We're gonna keep bringing the community together. You know check out our mailing list info at westernbackcountry.com if you have any other questions. Um, you know and if you if you have any questions ask these guys right now they're still tuned in. Um, we're gonna play a little video here at the end as people are kind of checking out but any last minute questions definitely let us know. I mean, we're here to help guys. That's, that's, that's who Weston is. Uh, we we want to be your backcountry buddy. We want to be your mentor. We want to make sure that you learn this stuff the right way, right? And, and that's really important to us. So thank you again for tuning in. We really do appreciate it. Uh, keep those questions coming. We're going to keep it rolling here for a little while.
And yeah, um, you know, you, you guys have just been great. So yeah, just uh, keep those questions coming. Otherwise, we will see you guys next week. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. See, we'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, we'll be here. Yeah, tomorrow, trip planning. <laughs> tomorrow, we're, we're going in depth in trip planning. So, so we're going to be doing a virtual tour. Um, this same link that you guys have used for this webinar, you can use tomorrow night as well. So make sure you ch chime in. Uh, we're we're going to get into it tomorrow. We're going to be going over all kinds of amazing trip planning resources with some of the best experts in the field. So thank you guys again for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Yeah, guides, feel free to turn your videos on now and, and chime in, say hello or say goodbye. And we will see you guys tomorrow night. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, I really appreciate everyone showing up. You. All right, gang. Oh, yes. You guys have a good night. We will see you tomorrow. Thanks for tuning in. Front Range Flip Fest online. <laughs>